Okay, um, thanks everybody. Welcome to another one of our um, lunchtime seminars. Good crowd in. Lovely day to be sitting inside, listening to some interesting stuff. Um, so, probably many of you are aware that, uh, well, actually, some of you may not be aware that the team responsible for the QB50 satellite that we built, the Eco satellite, um, was in the same place at the same time for the first time in about a year. So we all had dinner last night. And, um, <coughs> that um, the, the employees of the, the, were involved. Um, so there was a bit of discussion about this. We now have a 3D printed version of the uh, of the satellite, which is about this big. If anyone's interested in uh, eco merchandise, we can uh, we can now s satisfy your needs. I'm not going to present this <laughs> presentation, but I will. Well, I will introduce Ben, who was um, one of the, <coughs> the students who was um, played a very important role in developing the satellite. Specifically today, we're going to talk about the ADCS. Yes. Yes. Okay, over to Ben. So, the Eco CubeSat is part of a larger mission, the QB50 mission, in which we've got a free ride to space given that we fly the main instrument that we've been given, the ion neutral mass spectrometer. Um, we're also flying our own experiments, Kia, Rush, and Selbit, so full bit, sorry, which all of them have some requirements on the ADCS system itself. Importantly, we've been prescribed um, requirements by the YVKI that the INMS must point in a certain direction with a certain knowledge and a certain accuracy. Furthermore, Kia is a GNS reflectometry radio augmentation experiment, so we also must be pointing the antennas in the general direction for that to work. And Rush and Cell, Cell 4, they just need to make sure that we can point our solar panels in the right direction and have power for them to run. Um, as Andrew mentioned beforehand, the team working on QA50, in particular even the ADCS, we had undergrads, postgrads, and academic staff working on it at, at all times. So what we're going to talk about today is the ADCS requirements prescribed to us, the development environment and how we tested the ADCS, and the system itself, so the components that make up the ADC system and, and how they interact with one another. Then we'll talk about the detumbling and the pointing controllers and how we tested them and the results from that, as well as operations from the ADC point of view. So detumbling, these are the requirements given to us by VKI. Initially, we were told that we only needed to detumble from rates of plus or minus 10 degrees in any given direction. Late last year, this was up to plus or minus 50 degrees per second. It was quite late for them to come to us for that, but luckily enough, we'd already met that requirement. Uh, that was a result of their precursor flight and the experience they had from that precursor flight. Additionally, for the INMS, they need to know so the pointing knowledge is plus or minus 2 degrees. They need to know what way the INMS is facing so that they can correlate their data quickly. And they need to control the attitude within plus or minus 10 degrees. Uh, the development environment was very, very particular um, for UNSW. We developed a very, very interesting, not interesting, efficient way of doing things. We had eco in a clean hood most of the time. Eco was hooked up to an interface box, which was then hooked up to a server. This server, anyone on the development team could log into, program it, debug it, do whatever they wanted with it, without physically being touching it, without physically being in the room. They don't even have to be on campus to do this. Additionally, we later expanded this to include the ground station. So you could log onto another server, issue a remote command, control the radio, and also debug the remote control of of eco without actually physically having to be there or physically having to touch it. That reduced a lot of risk associated with handling the satellite and getting it dirty. Uh, additionally to this, we had a live camera feed above an air bearing where we could once again remotely watch and remotely view uh, attitude determinant and control tests. But for that obviously you have to handle the satellite to put it on and take it off, take it off the air bearing. So, I mentioned beforehand we used an air bearing to do this. Uh, we only had a single degree of freedom, a spherical air bearing, uh, and later on we um, upgraded our test week to include some helmet coils 
so that the external magnetic field was much larger, we could obtain results a lot quicker, and we could overcome any biases in the system itself. Uh, having a look at ECO itself, uh, this is with the solar panels removed. You can only just see the components here, but from an attitude determination and control system point of view, you can see one of the cameras sticking out at the top here. Uh, the INMS itself is up the front, but it's not very reflective. <coughs> and, um, and the battery's down at the bottom. If you look at this from an exploded point of view, we've got the cameras uh, here. So this is the CubeSense board from ESL. We've got a magnetometer on the OBC. Uh, we have another board which isn't pictured in here, which fits slightly um, just in between these two boards here. It was uh, a custom footprint so that we could get around those cameras. <coughs> okay. So the ADC system itself was comprised of components on multiple boards on, on, on the satellite. Uh, the OBC, the onboard computer, is on a board called Nanomine, supplied by Gormspace, which had a direct I2C connection with a magnetometer. This was the only thing we put on that bus. We had the other I2C bus on the satellite, which is the main bus, which connects the OBC to everything else, including our auxiliary board, the Eco auxiliary board, and CubeSense. Um, on Eco, on, uh, on the Eco auxiliary board, we implemented the gyro and a secondary magnetometer. So we split our magnetometers on two different buses. There were two different components. We had redundancy, we had hot standby control running in, in the OBC itself. So if something very bad was to happen and somehow something pulled the main I2C bus down, we could still detumble. Uh, the OBC controls the magnet talker, so it's a, a, a um, electric only actuation. Um, satellite <coughs> directly through uh, PW control and, and 3H bridges. Uh, the EOX board itself implemented our redundant file system, so it was controlled via the main eco microcontroller, which we interfaced to via I2C, and on the NanoMine itself, the OBC directly interfaced with an SD card. This was important so that one the ADC SD debugging data went to two redundant positions, and we can also get configuration files and commands up through the file systems from two different parts. And on CubeSense, we don't actually directly interface with the Sun and Earth sensor. We talk to a microcontroller which manages all of the onboard um, computer vision components. And like I said beforehand, the rest of the spacecraft is interfaced via that um, main I2C bus. Uh, just a quick closer look at, at CubeSense itself. So we've got our Nadir and our Sun Sensor oriented like this. You can order them in any which way that you want them to be um, mounted. We did it so that the Nadir camera was pointing out the face where our Nadir instruments were facing, which would make sense, so that whenever we're pointing in our normal direction, we always have an earth vector. Um, so on the PC104 interface here, that's where the main I2C interface is through the, um, to the OBC. And ECO itself, if I look back here, actually um, the ECO auxiliary board actually interfaces directly through to CubeSense. That's mainly so that we can get a picture because the interface over UART was a lot quicker. And um, what we did then is we dumped the, the picture directly straight into Flash and later on uh, the EOX board directly send that to the ground station with no OBC uh, involvement whatsoever. Uh, having a look at the magnet talkers, so we have an X and a Y rod which fit um, nice, and, nice and easily in the form factor of a standard board and the Z, the Z core uh, was an air, an air core basically because you don't want to have to figure out how to run a core um, down the longitudinal axis. Uh, the body frame of ECO was defined in maybe not so an intuitive way right now, but it will make sense a little bit later on. So the Z-axis was actually facing out the back of the satellite. Uh, like I said beforehand, the Y-axis was uh, so the Y-axis is our Nadir vector, so that is facing in the direction of our Nadir camera and all our Nadir pointing instruments, and the X-axis makes up the right-hand system. Looking at the 
two other main frame, reference frames you have to deal with for attitude determination, so our inertial frame and our orbit frame. Uh, the ECR frame is just the standard definition. Um, but the orbit frame we define in a way such that if we sent a attitude reference of zero, uh, ECO will align itself with the INMS pointing in the RAM direction and all of the linear facing instruments and the camera facing in, in the uh, Earth direction. Um, the orbit frame itself can be directly calculated from the user position and velocity because it's in the circular orbit as well, which makes this quite, quite an easy frame to define and calculate in real time. So, looking at the detumbling um, functionality, uh, we went with the very well known B dot controller. So, for those of you not familiar with the B dot controller, essentially you sample the Earth's magnetic field at t is equal to 1, sample it as t is equal to 2, take the difference between them and actuate with that but with a negative sign. Uh, we know that the torque produced by the interaction of the um, of a generated magnetic field and an external magnetic field is a right hand um, rule. So M cross with B gives you a desired torque. And if you want to visualize it, you can look at the, this is a spacecraft body frame with this rectangle. So if you imagine that this was rotating um, clockwise, at B is equal to uh, the previous time step. Uh, this would potentially be a, a measured vector. And as the satellite rotated, it would appear to have moved that way in, in the body frame. So then our M vector is in the negative direction, but of the same, um, uh, sorry, it's just the negated and scaled version of that. So essentially we just uh, took the difference, scaled it so that when we were at maximum emission parameters, we would saturate our PWM drivers. And then what you would have is M cross with B would give you a desired torque in the opposite direction of your actual angular velocity. Uh, this was done at, at one hertz, uh, this controller. And like I said beforehand, we use uh, separate redundant magnetometers and redundant I squared C buses to do so. <coughs> so initially, uh, we started testing the detumble controller uh, without the Helmholtz coil. So we didn't have this yet, we borrowed this from Sydney here. So what we did was like any good scientists would do, we do a baseline. So we get the, the air bearing, we give it a little nudge in a certain direction. <coughs> we let that run for a certain amount of time, sometimes hours, sometimes a day, I think we got up to once. And then what we do is we turn the satellite on, nudge it again, same direction, same initial velocity, track it over time. So this, this tracking was done with the um, overhead camera that you saw in, in the previous picture. And these oscillations here are due to the camera not being aligned with the rotational axis of the satellite itself. And what you can see here is somewhat a detumbling behaviour being exhibited, but what you don't see is it actually coming down to zero degrees per second. So while we are somewhat convinced that this is detumbling, we're not 100% certain. So what do we do? We bring the Helmholtz coils in and we turn them on. So right now, in the lab, Helmholtz coils off, we had anywhere between four to 600 milligauss of magnetic field. We turned on the Helmholtz coils, we had about five or six gauss itself. So it was, it was all order of magnitude increase. And if you go back to this equation here, a whole order of magnitude increase in your B gives you a whole order of magnitude increase <coughs> in your torque. So what we did, we then detumbled, um, oh, sorry, what we did, we did a baseline with the coil off and with the coil on. Because uh, there is ferrous material in the satellite itself, so the satellite itself will try to detumble without any um, actuation itself, just like a compass will. So we compared these two uh, baselines with the coil off in blue, the coil on in green. It actually manages to detumble on its own without the controller being turned on. But then what you can see is we turn the controller on, note the time scale difference between these two graphs, and detumbling was achieved in, in less than two minutes. So we're no longer testing for hours or even a day, we can get a result within minutes. And at this time, this was starting from, from the specified 
plus or minus 10 degrees per second. Um, so this is just the results for plus and minus x and, and y. We don't do the tests about z. Uh, you can imagine that the z axis is the long axis. To stand it up on the air bearing, I'm not liable, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, what we can, though, get from these two tests um, is confirmation that it would work in the z direction. If there was, say, an axis misalignment or one of the, the torque rods weren't working, there'd be a large discrepancy in any of these four detumble curves here. And we'd, by elimination, be able to determine which coil or which transformation was, was wrong. Um, interestingly enough, if we remember that first graph, uh, the detumble curve never quite, quite reaches zero. Uh, on the air bearing itself, there are two main disturbances. There's the friction itself due to the velocity of, of the spacecraft, but due to manufacturing uh, tolerances, the jets aren't quite aligned in the, the jets that um, hold the, the, the air bearing itself up. So what you get is a, a bias in the system, a, a turbine torque. In this case, it was a torque produced in the positive direction uh, from the camera's perspective. So when we looked at that first graph from the positive direction, that turbine torque is assisting at the initial velocity so that the controller itself has to fight against it. While coming from the negative direction, that turbine torque actually assists the tumbling. And you, you can see that just in the difference between these two um, gradients of the, the baseline curves. And once again, tests from larger initial velocities. So th these tests were done from 45 or 50 degrees per second, but we actually demonstrated it in the lab up to about 70 degrees per second. It, it's interesting to note that detumbling from roughly 50 degrees per second is still much quicker than the baseline starting at, at 10 degrees per second. So moving on to, on to pointing. So we split the pointing problem up into two problems. Obviously determining the attitude and controlling the attitude. To determine the attitude, we just use an extended Kármán filter with all of the sensors I mentioned beforehand. So the gyro, the sun vector, the earth vector measured by cube sense, and the magnetic vector measured by the magnetometers. And the attitude controller was based on a um, cascaded PID structure, but we just disabled the integral branch in, in software. But it actually still is, is there if we do decide to use it later on. So the attitude determination itself, so this is the determining what way we're, we're pointing part. Um, so once we've moved into pointing mode, the actuation still is speed or control. Okay. We don't want to start doing any control actuation until we know where we're pointing and we're very certain that's the direction we're pointing. So until all of this has um, run and the covariance matrices are small enough, then the controller kicks in. So we move into pointing mode, what the what ECO will do is ECO will wait for any two vectors to come through at, at the same um, epoch. It will run the triad algorithm, a deterministic way of determining attitude. That will then be used to initialize the Kármán filter, and, and then we can start running the Kármán filter itself. Um, so the prediction stage is a simple Quaternion kinematics dynamic. So uh, what you notice here is in our state, our estimated state is the attitude, so the Quaternion itself, which is a four by one vector, and the gyro bias is a three by one vector. So what we can do is we estimate these biases we negate them from the measured um, gyro readings, and the result of that we use to propagate the state of, of, the, of the satellite. Um, it's also a multi-rate Kármán filter. So whenever a measurement update is performed, we don't need all of the sensors to be available. So if for some reason that the Earth sensors are only available at 10 hertz, or sorry, every 10 seconds, but the sun is every 5 seconds, that, that, that's fine. The, the current filter will, will accommodate that. Um, so 
what we needed is we needed these measurements in the body frame. We needed uh, these measurements in the inertial frame, which we had to generate from models on board. So the Earth sensor measures the vector from the satellite to the Earth. So obviously that in the inertial frame is the inverse of your position vector. So we can get that from an orbit propagator. The sun vector in the inertial frame is based on a simple uh, mean motion in the ecliptic plane. You just need the, the time of day to calculate that. And the B vector, so the magnetic vector in the inertial frame is based on a 12th order spherical harmonic model, which actually is the most computationally expensive part of this entire, entire system. Um, the orbit frame definition takes the position and velocity information from the orbit propagator and then turns out the, the orbit frame quaternion as a rotation from the Earth-centered inertial frame to the orbit frame itself, which is used later on in the algorithm, as well as the angular velocity of the orbit frame in the inertial frame. Okay, so we simulated the attitude determination. Um, <coughs> with all the sensors on, basically all the combinations of sensors on, but I'm only going to present the, the interesting combinations today. So with all of the sensors on, what we can see is that for the majority of the orbit, our attitude knowledge is within the prescribed plus or minus two degrees per second. We do go above this, um, this limit only when the sun vector is no longer available. So when we're in eclipse for a short period of time, the error in our estimated um, attitude does exceed the, the limits. But importantly enough, we know it. We know about it. We can check the data against the covariance matrix and we can possibly throw some out if, if the covariances are too high. Um, one of the main philosophies around designing this system was that everything had to be transparent from the ground. With a basic command you can say debug EKF data and you'll know that in the next log file you'll get a few lines of code with basically the state of every part of your current filter. Or you might want to debug the B dot controller and you'll get the state of everything so of that. And we can actually script that as well so if we get to a part of the mission where we found that this is how the operation should go on. We can write a script, upload it, and permanently run it as if it was built in the firmware itself. Um, no Earth sensor. This looks uh, a lot worse. And that's because the Earth sensor is always available when you're pointing it in the normal direction. So what we can see here is that the Earth sensor is um, much more valuable in the important than the sun sensor. Uh, no sun sensor, worse performance, you can see that the uh, convergence takes a little bit longer. Uh, this simulation was actually done with a random initialization, so the, the current filter itself does converge with any values given to it to initialize, but we don't want to risk anything um, in the mission, so we initialize it with the triad results. And you can see with no sun sensor, it's nearly, nearly the same um, profile in the error. And this is due to the, the points in the orbit where the um, magnetic field of the Earth is aliasing with the sun vector. So no mag sensor whatsoever, even worse. So you can see where we got the philosophy of why the magnetometer has, there's two of them on two separate buses, why we point the Earth sensor at Earth and why we really just take the sun vector whenever it's um, there as an opportunistic way. We can see with the no magnetic um, sensor, it's, it's nearly unusable. Un okay. okay, so the attitude controller is um, based on cascaded PID controllers. We have a quaternion PID controller uh, outputting uh, desired angular body rates. Uh, the input is obviously the error in, in your quaternion. And then we've got some inverse kinematics. Oh, sorry, the inverse kinematics actually produce the um, desired body rates. The output of the quaternion PID controller uh, 
outputs a desired quaternion rate, and then we've got a basic PID controlling, standard PID um, controlling the body rates themselves. Um, beforehand, I mentioned that the uh, angular velocity of the orbit frame was calculated, as well as the orbit frame itself. <coughs> Um, what we do is, with basic quaternion multiplication, we can take the quaternion rotating the eco in the inertial frame, multiply it by, um, we perform an inverse, then we can multiply it by the quaternion relating the um, orbit frame back to Earth, and then we get a rotation uh, describing the rotation of eco to the orbit frame. So. Quaternion uh, of body to the orbit frame. And then once we have that, we can rotate it once again by a desired reference that we've uploaded. So a reference in the orbit frame. So then we rotate, um, rotate the orbit frame against the body so that now the output of this is the rotation from the body to the reference, i.e. the error in the desired attitude. Um, so the, uh, again, the orbit frame definition produced the angular velocity of the orbit frame uh, in the uh, earth center inertial frame. We can then transform that with a similar method into the body frame. So at this point here, we've got the desired offset in attitude and the desired offset in attitude rate. That's fed into a quaternion PID controller, which generates a um, desired quaternion rate. Inverse kinematics convert that, like I said beforehand, into a angular velocity uh, in the body frame set point. We negate that from the current angular velocity estimate, so the gyro measurement minus the bias, and that's fed in, into the rest of the controller. Um, additionally, I put this extra section in here down just as my own experiment. Um, once the uh, body rate controller has finished executing, the output of that is a desired torque. Okay? So to convert that into an actuation vector, we can use our torque is equal to m cross b, swap that around so m is equal to b cross t. But then I was wondering, okay, the b measurement is noisy, but the estimated b would be less noisy because it's, it's run through the, the Kalman filter. So it would take the B vector in the inertial frame, rotate it by the um, estimated attitude, and that would be B in the body frame calculated at that point. So at that point, it, it's even really independent of the mag sensor itself. The mag sensor could be offline if you ignore how bad it performs um, without that. So we have a switch that we can configure from the ground, whether or not we use the measured, the instantaneous measured value of B, or, or the calculated value of B. Um, I might skip this slide if anyone has questions on how the quaternion controller works and the inverse kinematics works, we can come back to this later on, just to know it's there. And um, that, that, that's it for the, the pointing. We, we have some demonstration videos of pointing on the air bearing itself, but the dynamics of the air bearing aren't representative whatsoever of what, what space is considering the turbine tour, uh, the ridiculous amount of inertia that's going to be on it. So we essentially um, validated the controller structure by testing it, making sure that it would point and recover from it, any, any offset in, in um, attitude. And we will um, upload the correct, or we think we have the correct controller gains programmed in there, but should we find uh, controller gains that are more optimal, we can upload them later on. Okay, so from an operations point of view, um, this is the eco mission itself. So we're deployed from the ISS. There's a 30 minute delay before we can do anything, anything whatsoever. Um, after that, ADCS will turn on. If the satellite isn't in safe mode for some reason, uh, it'll initiate detumbling straight away. And once we've detumbled and some other things, we can point and then the mission starts. So 
So a lot of things have to go right from an ADCS point of view until the mission can start. Um, looking closer at the ADC um, S operations, so we've deployed, it'll actually perform a self-test. So this self-test is just a small, small node which runs for about a minute where it turns on each individual Mac talker, measures the current, logs it, uh, turns on the magnetic talker, measures the magnetic field, logs it, turns everything off, measures the magnetic field, measures everything, logs it, uh, does some basic heuristic checks, yes, satellite's not on fire, next mode. Uh, it's all logged, it's downloaded, and um, we, we can check that later on. After that's passed, we go into a detumble uh, indefinitely mode, so just actuate forever. Um, once We've uploaded a TLE and confirmed that the orbit propagator is outputting the correct data. We will then move into the detumble mode. And the only difference between these two is at the end of detumble mode, there's a uh, very simple low pass filter estimating the angular rate. Uh, because in detumble mode, there is no attitude estimation, no angular rate estimation. There's uh, just a small filter estimating angular rate. And after that, if that evaluates the rate is less than a configurable um, threshold, which we've set to be one degree per second at the moment, we'll automatically move into pointing. Um, apart from that, automatically, we've got an ADCS scheduler. So we can upload a file to say, at this time, point in this direction, at this time, reperform re -perform the self-test, then detangle for a while, don't do anything for this day, point here, take a photo then, um, and that, that's all done automatically in, in a high priority task. Uh, so if, if the satellite has come down to a non-nominal run level, uh, some of the less priority, lower priority tasks like the experiment will be turned off, ADCS itself will continue to run. And um, the scripting itself, we can, we can, like I said before, we've got a scripting, um, we've got support to, to write whatever functionality we want in a script and upload it. Uh, alternatively, we can manually control the entire satellite via a remote shell when, there, when there's an uplink. Um, from the ADCS point of view, there's 39 parameters which are hard-coded in the satellite with defaults. Uh, they're also um, able to be changed from the ground in RAM and later on stored in, on the SD card, which will override those hard-coded um, defaults. And that's nearly everything um, in terms of the ADCS. CubeSense itself, that was implemented because for some reason CubeSense doesn't have non-volatile memory. Whenever it boots up, it just takes in whatever it's in front of so we had to build that in uh, as kind of a workaround. But the, this functionality was there, the skeleton was already there because the ADCS um, configuration. Uh, like I mentioned beforehand, we can modify these configurations in RAM. Uh, so if something does go wrong, the satellite turns off because of something we did. It's not going to be the end of life because it'll reboot and load the last no good, good configuration. We can then um, manually move RAM into the file system, or we can just FTP up straight away. <coughs> um, here's some of the configurations. I'm not going to go through all of them. But from a general ADCS point of view, we've got the um, logging functionality. So I want to log level 1, 2, 3, or 4. Logging level 4 is crazy. It's logging each incrementing part of the code. <laughs> Log level one is basically, I've gone into this mode, I exited it because I did this, or I've done that. That's the default mode. Uh, talk ticks, uh, the ACS task itself runs at 10 hertz. Uh, what we found is that regardless, yeah, regardless of whether you're detumbling or pointing, you need to read the magnetometer. Uh, when you have a magnetic actuated satellite and a magnetometer, there might be problems. So what we did is we have a configurable torque tick. So the magnet talkers will only run for that amount of torque ticks per 10 um, ticks of the main loop. 
So at 10 hertz, ADCS runs, uh, the torque ticks is uh, running seven. So for the first seven ticks, the magnet torques will actuate, then they'll turn off, and then on the very first tick of the next main ADCS loop, we read all the magnetometer data, regardless of what mode we're in. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. So we've got uh, hot standby parameters for magnetometers. We've, we can disable or enable tube sense. So we can say, okay, I just want to completely throw out my sun vectors because something's gone wrong with the camera. I don't want to put the, the attitude determination at risk. Uh, we've got all the pointing controllers, and we can actually um, change the, the parameters that it used to initialize the, the Kármán filter and covariance matrix as well. Uh, a high-level view of the ADCS interface from the ground. So operating from the ground station, like I said beforehand, the two main ways to talk to ADCS by FTP and the file system, or directly from command through the remote shell and then through to the ADCS task itself. Um, other tasks um, do interface the ADCS, so the INMS needs to know what way it's pointing. So the INMS will request the ADCS, what is your current attitude estimate and your confidence in that attitude estimate. And that's logged as part of the scientific data, not as part of the ADCS debug data. <coughs> yeah, the rest of this is quite self-explanatory. So on the file system, there's a fair few files um, which are present on the SD card as well as on the redundant flash memory on the EDOX card. That's why I was saying that it's quite important that we had that redundancy because without, for instance, the TLA, attitude determination would never work, therefore we can never point. Uh, videos. <clears throat> so I'll just show you a quick video of the testing of the pointing. It's not the prettiest of things. So on the left is a live feed of that um, overhead camera on the air bearing. On the right is a remote session with the ground station computer. So these are two separate beings. Um, two separate computers, and I'm not even in the room right now. I'm remotely logged into both of them. Um, what I've done over here is, so I've typed in remote one, so that's telling the ground station, all right, we want to do a remote command. I've then typed in ADCS set reference, and then a bunch of numbers which represent a negative pitch of 45 degrees. And you can see that nearly instantaneously it actuates. Uh, you can see that there's a bunch of error messages these reply minuses and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's not an actual message. We just hadn't updated the ground station software to accommodate that yet. Uh, whenever a remote command is issued, um, it'll reply back with a 32-bit response code, which the ground station thought at that moment if it wasn't zero, it was an error. But it's actually it's meaningful data. Anything more than 32 bits, we then log in a file and download later on. So ADCS set ref 001, it should just align itself with what it thinks the, or the orbit frame is. So for this test here, we've got the magnetic field going across the screen because of the Helmholtz coils you can see here. I've overridden the sun sensor because I couldn't get a light source to emulate the sun properly in that room. Um, and it thinks it's in this direction here, so that any um, rotation about that axis won't affect the attitude determination algorithm. And then I've overridden the orbit propagator so that it thinks that the orbit frame is um, Z pointing this way, Y pointing out of the screen, and X making up the right-handed system. Okay. I'm not going to let this go on. This goes on for quite a while, I'm trying out all different combinations of to and from attitudes. So th this is a demonstration of the attitude determination running as well as the controller that we just talked about. And even operations. So during the uplink, if you wanted, you could bung in a manual reference. That brings the presentation to a conclusion. Are there any questions?
yeah. by ourselves, but the one that we did with Zuni Uni, yeah. how much of this lives on their satellite? Um, the entire code base lives on their satellite. With these configuration parameters, as I was telling you, with enable Earth, disable Sun, um, there's actually more to it. There was a core Sun and a fine Sun. So in software, whenever we build, you literally typed in build UCID, and then it would just hash to find out our sensors and put theirs in. Um, yeah, so it's the same code base. On that note, have you done an error analysis for what they expect to get their attitude determination yes, down to with did, their configuration? This, the, those simulations don't apply because they had a core sun sensor, they had a larger field of view yep. as opposed to ours. But yeah, yeah, we did. Did they make their requirements? Just. Okay, very good. Why not? Do you have a plan for how we're going to uh, calibrate the satellite once it gets deployed? In terms of? Making sure that it points in the right direction, we've got the right gains. Um, yep, it'll, it'll be a combination of those log debug levels mm -hmm. and uploading the gains later on. So it'll be done on, on the ground. I thought that was very impressive. Uh, could you just indicate how many man hours work for the rest? <laughs> 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 um, um, <laughs> I don't want to think about it. <laughs> how does the detumbling work actually? <clears throat> how does the detumbling work? Yeah. You use thrusters, jet or something to like uh, Do you use thrusters? Or no, 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 it's entirely magnetic. Magnet magnetically actuated. Okay. So the magnetor mm -hmm. produces a magnetic field, which is N on this. Okay, and so you use the Earth's magnetic field to like actually yes. turn itself. Yeah, so the or torque produced problem? by that is the cost product of the two. Okay, so how big is it? Is it like this, this small? Like, because if it's big, it won't, the torque won't be enough. It, it will, it'll just, we expect it to take up to two days to detour. But yeah, it's a two unit. Up to two days. Yeah, it's a lot of bridge. But we obviously don't have time to do two days, each axis, each direction. Oh, I forgot to turn this parameter on, start again. Mm -hmm. That's why we use the Helmholtz coils. Okay. Did the onboard electronics generate their own magnetic fields that could interfere? Yes and no. We found that the radio, in all of its um, shielding efforts, actually retained the magnetic field from the magnetometers, magnetometers, sorry. So we had to completely reorganize the stack after we realized this to separate the magnetorker from other elements that were ferrous because they would retain it much longer than the 300 milliseconds we could allocate. So when you ran your experiments, did you power up any of the other systems to see yeah. their effect? Yeah, that, that was done as well as part of the power profiling. We, we run everything to see if it's consuming the expected amount of power. You actually showed the uh, simulations with the different sensors with being out of action, so, and the magnetic sensor is the one that's most critical, yep. uh, apparently. And then the next one is the Earth sensor and then the Sun sensor. Yep. But how much redundancy is there in the information from the three? Um, so can you back uh, the some of the information for the other two from the Sun sensor, say? Um, and maybe using some fixed models about the magnetic field um, around the Earth. Uh, and so could there be a way to make the someone more um, uh, representative of the other two, uh, if there's a failure of the magnetic sensor say. Uh, you do only need two mm -hmm. separate measurements for attitude determination. And obviously, if the two reference vectors in the inertial frame are pointing in the same direction, it's, it's useless. Oh, it's, yeah. it's like yeah. having, and, and you saw that in the test. Um, So at this point here, that's where the Earth's magnetic field mm -hmm. is actually aligned with the inverse position vector. Mm -hmm. So it is essentially the same measurement. Mm -hmm. So we're only updating the attitude estimation based on one measurement, which over time is going to diverge. 
Oh, it does not merge, does it? Okay. okay. Yeah. Be because you've only got information mm. rotating two of the axes, and then that third one isn't defined. Yeah. And over mm -hmm. time, the gyro bias and all oh, in order to take it, take it out. So that's what the sun sensor would uh, correct for if, if it were operating well, when it is operational. So. The idea of having multiple sensors measuring different things is diversity. Mm -hmm. So the diversity of what you're measuring in the inertial frame. But for what reason? For redundancy? Uh, so that uh, if one does fail, um, no, you've for, got... For an optimal solution itself. Ah, so, well, it's, so, so it is actually, the information from all three is actually used. Yeah, so, so uh, if so, yeah. all three were, say, running, or all three sensors were running, and I was in some position, it's probably imaginary, where the Earth's magnetic field aligned with the Earth vector, and I was in pure eclipse, so that all three aligned, I've still only got one measurement. Yeah. So you can imagine as, as the satellite's orbiting over the entire orbit, the measurement vectors are mm -hmm. moving around and you've got more, more diversity in the measurement, less likelihood that two will track with one another for a little bit as well. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. The, the, the redundancy point of view was for the magnetometers because if one fails, it would be problem. Oh, yes. That was yes. the main yes. point yes. of redundancy. Yes. Yeah. Does the GPS help you at all? The GPS can provide a more accurate um, position of or city solution, but it's not necessary for this. But it, it can, it can plug back into, it can plug back in and provide us this information instead of the full mainland again. But it's a payload, yeah, we don't want to rely on the payload. Does the Earth sensor work in Eclipse? It works whenever there's a well-defined horizon. Yes. So that's the answer. <laughs> Does it work when it's dark? Um, the University of Surrey, I think, reported that it, it had reduced accuracy. Okay. Because then yeah, you might want to run a simulation with no sun sensor and no earth sensor. I've done that. Okay. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been eclipsed for each other? Um, oh, roughly, we mentioned roughly, I'm not sure to be honest. Because if, if you're over the ocean or, you know, sparsely populated areas, it's going to be very dark. Yeah, it, it, it's only, it just looks for the horizon, yeah. and from there it determines the centroid of that sphere. Okay. So it's not actually the content of what's below you, okay. as long as there's a well-defined horizon, I thought it was looking for a field of view. Yeah. So, so within that field of view, it's, it's 170 degrees. Okay. Within that field of view, if there's enough of the, the horizon yeah. arc in it, it can determine the centroid. So it doesn't matter if, as long as that horizon is, is, is present. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, which orbit are you planning to put the satellite in? So we'll be deployed from the ISS. So 400 kilometers, 52 degrees inclination. Unless if they really give it a kick. <laughs> so just quickly, uh, the uh, two-day convergence time, that's just due to the uh, limited torque of the actuators, right? So the, uh, what convergence time? The two-day convergence time. Do yeah, you? it's the limited torque available. Right. Yeah. So up, up at our at 400 forms, we expect maybe 300 milligauss. So 20 times less than what we had on the bench. Right. So, way less so than 400 than times the... the, the um, Time. Was the passive detumbling from the ferrous material in the satellite, was that taken into account with your requirements for detumbling time and rate? Um, so did they say, you know, in a worst case scenario where you're tumbling not, you know, an axis that helped me get the helpful passive detumbling? Yeah, so the passive detumbling isn't going to be significant at all up, up in, in flight because the external magnetic field is so low. Uh, what some teams do do is they use wings out the back for some passive decumbling with drag, but um, with ferrous material, no, it, it's not, not really practical. You mentioned that when you did the, um, the lab simulation, or lab, uh, not simulation, but the operation, um, that uh, you had to turn some sensor off because you couldn't get a, a suitable mm -hmm. source of the sun. Well, 
A, is that how big a deal is that? I think you showed that without the sun sensor, it doesn't make a big difference. But B, what properties would you need from a um, from a uh, simulated sun to do that? Um, you need a very very bright point source. It's bright. It's okay. bright as can be because the su the sun camera and the earth sensor are physically different. There's a filter in, in the sun camera, so that you, with not mm -hmm. um, looking at Jupiter or the stars or a reflection off the Earth or something like that. So you need a very bright point source to, to okay. give you that. So it's primarily brightness rather than spectrum, is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you, could you get some numbers on what how bright that might be? Or would it be useful to do that? Uh, um, I'm just wondering if there's something we might be able to. Um, Might be more useful, but in terms of what we were testing on the bench, we were testing the control at that point. Mm -hmm. there. We tested the determination algorithm in, in that lab, and I could override sensors and yeah. confirm that just the filter itself still converges to the correct yeah. solution. So the implementation of the filter from that lab into C code was, was correct. At that point, then, we just needed a simple setup to test the control. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. But whether your sun simulators might be useful to us is something we could take offline. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But obviously, yeah. having a full end to end test yeah. would have been. Which microcontroller did you use? Mm -hmm. Which microcontroller? Like Raspberry Pi or Arduino or like. Oh, no. Um, no. <laughs> Not flying Arduinos. Um, mm -hmm. It's an 1891 SAM. So we run free RTOS on the OBC. And there's a second microcontroller on the EAUX. Oh, there's like a thousand on the on the <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the OBC itself, so that's the 1891. Uh, th that's a pick, and that's, a, that's another pick on, on CubeSense. All right. I think if anyone else has got any other questions, you can come and ask them when we've pitched, or when we've, um, after we've pitched. So um, we'll call it a day for now, and uh, those who want to leave can leave, those who want to ask questions can hang around. So thanks again, Ben.